Mr. Crispin here once again and welcome to my workshop. Now before I begin a couple of little updates. First of all I've recently been away in Northern Ireland. Billy and I went over on holiday to see mum and dad and to help them with a project and while we were over there I made a little video of what we got up to. Now this is a machining channel and always will be and I didn't want to take the audience for granted so what I've done is I've released this video as an unlisted one meaning that you can watch it if you follow the link that I've posted in this description. Now have a look if you wish to and I'll leave it up to you. If you tell me in the comments that you don't mind the odd non-machining video then in the future I may post the odd one. However I know there's a few of you who are fairly machining orientated and as you've told me in the past you do not expect to see any video that does not include a machine tool. Yes that's machine tool in capital letters so anyway I'll leave that one up to you. Now in other news I have been busily working away here on a rebuild of my Harrison lathe. Some of you may have seen that before. I've not really shown you much on camera but I've got some chunkier components coming up on the locomotive so I decided it was high time to get that lathe in operation and you will see a video fairly shortly called Reviving a Lathe. Anyway on to today's topic and uh, let me get started. So this is my locomotive so far. It's the topic of most of my machining videos and over the course of time that I've been building it I've received quite a few questions from people who are potentially considering building a locomotive. And they ask things like what locomotive is it, how long does it take to build a locomotive, where do you get the drawings etc. Now those are good little questions that I can answer in the comments but what I want to try and do today is set out more of an overview to help any potential builder decide first of all whether or not they want to build a locomotive but secondly if they do then what locomotive might they want to pursue. Now if I was to take all the questions and try and condense them into one common phrase it would read something along the lines of Mr Crispin what locomotive are you building? Where did you get the drawings? If I was to build one what would you recommend and how long is it going to take me? Well that's the kind of theme that I want to discuss today and hopefully by the end of the video I've given you some ideas that you can go away and think about. Now before I get into this I do have a couple of um, assumptions and points to mention. First of all despite appearances I'm not a train spotter so although I can talk about this I can't really tell you any details about full-size locomotives I can't tell you what lines they ran on, I can't tell you what engine shunted what engine, I can't tell you what years any particular engineer or engine ran. Uh, yeah, I don't know much about locomotives. I chose a locomotive purely for the engineering project aspect. Okay, now the second thing I want to mention is some assumptions. I'm going to assume that the people asking these questions and potentially considering building a locomotive, first of all, have already done various machining projects involving lots of pieces, maybe a steam plant or an internal combustion engine or perhaps they work in engineering and do complicated machining. Um, secondly, I'm going to assume they've got access to a lathe and a milling machine, some bracing equipment, bench and vice etc. And I'm going to assume that you are fairly competent in your skills in manufacturing. Now, Building a locomotive isn't massively complicated to a lot of the things people might do in their workplaces. I, for instance, work at Rolls-Royce and nothing on this locomotive is remotely complicated compared to anything I do at work. However, building a locomotive at home is the thing. It's at home, you're doing it all uh, to your own methods with your own equipment and so it becomes complicated in itself. So when I say complicated, I don't mean that it's like part of a rocket, I mean that it's complicated to get it all together yourself. So that's my starting point and I'm doing this totally unscripted but I have had a little think about some things I want to mention and the topic for this video reads along these lines technical points, motivations, project scope, project choices and resources. Now to kick off I'm going to talk a little bit about the actual locomotive itself and what about it may suit a first time builder because we've got two skill sets here, there's the machining skill set and there's the locomotive skill set, locomotive building skill set. Now obviously if you work in machining 
you will already have the machining skill set but potentially not the locomotive building skill set and I would probably say that until you've actually built a locomotive you don't have the locomotive skill set. Uh, I certainly am developing that and uh, I'm about probably halfway with this one by the time I get to the end of it I'll know how to build a locomotive at the moment I don't and one of the purposes for me building this is to see how they all work. Now technical points when you look at locomotives there's different uh, things to consider but I'm going to mention three things that you may want to look for for a first time builder. First of all outside cylinders the cylinders on this locomotive bolt on the outside and by the cylinder going on the outside it consequently means that all the running gear valve works, wheels and rods are also on the outside. If you go for a locomotive that has its cylinders on the inside, as many do, then once you've got the boiler on, all that workings can only be accessed from underneath. So if you don't yet have the locomotive building skill set, you are confining all your parts within that box basically, and it can get very tricky. At least when it's all on the outside you can all get to it. So outside cylinders is a good idea for a first time locomotive and this is indeed outside cylinders. Next uh, a parallel boiler that is assuming you're going to make the boiler yourself. Um, a parallel boiler such as this locomotive has offers a lot less complication than say the tapered boiler equivalent or more complicated design of boiler. And finally I'm going to say potentially you may wish to choose slide valves over piston valves. They're the two main form of cylinder valve mechanism on a locomotive. Slide valve, it's a sliding plate that controls the valve events. Piston valve, it's a piston that controls the valve events. Now this is a piston valve locomotive uh, so I'm probably contradicting myself slightly but I think if you are a first time builder a slide valve locomotive would be a more forgiving build. So that's the main points about the locomotive, but a few other points uh, revolve around your circumstances and your machinery. And it's mostly a question of thinking, what machinery do I have access to and therefore what locomotive can I build? And although um, you know, in some ways you don't want to let the machinery hold you back, over the course of something like a whole locomotive it's going to get pretty tedious if the machine you are using is either too small or greatly too big. So I would just have a think about um, what size equipment you've got and then perhaps think about matching the size of the locomotive to that. One nice thing with locomotives is some designs are quite common across different sizes. The most common three sizes of locomotive are three and a half inch gauge, five inch gauge, seven and a quarter inch gauge and that refers to the spacing between the wheels. So Decide sort of what locomotive you want to build and then perhaps consider which gauge you want to build it in around the machinery you've got. Um, most importantly though, with all those things in mind, build something you want to build. So when you are looking at locomotives, pick something you like. Consider those technical points I've mentioned, but if you pick those technical points ahead of something you actually want to build, chances are it won't get finished. A locomotive is a long-term project and by and large life events get in the way. I've uh, proved that myself and you end up having long gaps coming back to it, long gap coming back to it. And unless it's something you really want to build, the tendency is for those long gaps to be the death of the project you're building. So consider the technical points because they're going to make it easier long-term to build. But pick something you like because that is ultimately what's going to sustain your interest and get you to the point of finishing a locomotive. Moving on to the next um, topic, sort of leads on from that, and that is the topic of motivations. When you have seen a locomotive and you've thought, I want to build a locomotive, what is it that you have thought that's given you the motivation to want to build one? Is it the idea of replicating something in full size down to model scale? Is it because you want something to drive around the track? Is it the engineering involved and the mechanical assemblies and the mechanical project aspects of it? Or do you just want something to display in your house? Now I think carefully about those because each of those things will take you down a different route 
and I'll try and give you a few examples. Personally, I'm building it for the engineering. As I said, I don't know anything about full-size locomotives. I've got no nostalgia to the steam era. The pure reason I chose a locomotive is that there's not many projects I can fit in a workshop this big that involve as many pieces and the intricacies and I enjoy the mechanical nature of a steam vehicle over more electronic modern things. Um, internal combustion engines, traction engines, steam vehicles for the road also are of a similar nature to this. If you can find something with enough pieces to, disain, to sustain your interest then if you're building it for the mechanical engineering side of things you know any of those will be a great project. Now if you're building it for the purposes of running around a track I would encourage you to think quite carefully about how much time do you want to spend building it versus running it on the track. Again my own opinion on this is I'm much more interested in building it than driving it around the track. I'm sure when I eventually do finish it I will enjoy driving it around the track to prove it all out but I have no real intention of spending one afternoon a week driving around the track. If what you want to do is drive around the track then the five or however many years worth of building the locomotive may not be worth it. You may wish to either pick a locomotive that is simpler and will get you to the point that you can actually drive it quicker or you may wish to buy one etc. So think carefully about that. If your ambition is to have a locomotive you can just go and run then the whole process of building it may not get you to what you're wanting um, particularly quickly. Uh, static display, yeah, a few people ask me you know, how about building a locomotive just to display by all means. I don't think you really need to go into much detail with that. I mean all the detail on this thing is to make it work and that's where all the thought goes in. If you wanted this static display model then get a picture and copy it. Um, a nice metalwork project but uh, totally different to the complexities of building a running locomotive. So again if your motivation was to develop the mechanical engineering a static model isn't going to fulfill that to the same potential. Finally the true scale builder as they sometimes term themselves someone who finds the true scale and copies it. Now uh, that's probably perfectionism at its highest level and I have great respect for those builders, uh, particularly anyone who copies something themselves, you know, goes and finds it, measures it all up, scales it down and makes a really um, first class job of matching the original, uh, you know, rivet for rivet. Um, typically people go and take photos, take their tape measure, find something, the original locomotive, measure it, take the paint colours, look at the rivet heads and then they come and find someone like me who spent however many years building their locomotive and they say um, wouldn't it be better if you had used a pan head rivet on this step yeah so uh, different motivations and uh, hopefully that little section gave you an overview of something to, uh, to consider decide what it is about a locomotive you saw that made you think I want a locomotive and then think was it the building was it the running was it the visual appearance Think about that and let that guide you on deciding what path to pursue. Next up, the project scope. Now this is um, one I want to go through some details on time scales, money, equipment. The average locomotive takes three to four thousand hours to build. Quite a lot of time and typically I'd say a locomotive builder may be retired you're talking about four to five years. A friend of mine, Richard Gibbon, he can turn them around in about three years. Over the course of his life he's built 15 locomotives. He goes quite a bit quicker than I do. Uh, but I'd say four to five years is probably about your average time scale for someone with plenty of time to spend on it. I uh, work five days a week and I do other things. I tick over on this and that's about it. Um, I would say still though the number of years I've been at it that I probably have put three or four thousand hours work in but I've been trying to film it. So if you are remotely interested in finishing a locomotive in a reasonable number of years don't bother trying to film it. I think it adds probably a good 50% on uh, you know if not more 
and yeah I, I'm about halfway with this one if I hadn't been trying to film it the whole way I may be an awful lot closer to finishing it based on just the number of hours filming and everything adds on so yeah that's uh what am I talking about here <coughs> Ah yes, I, I was talking about time scales. Yeah, so three to four thousand hours for the average locomotive builder, um, depending on, of course on your methods and standards. Now, um, next up, equipment. So there's a nice idea in traditional model engineering that you can do, you know, everything on your Myford lathe. That would be the traditional English model engineer's outlook, and I'm sure people have built whole locomotives just on a Myford lathe doing all the milling with a vertical slide. Um, I have built a V-twin double acting oscillating steam engine in that method, all on the Myford, doing all the milling vertically. I think if you were to try and build a locomotive like that, you would be sick to the back teeth of trying to do milling on a lathe by the time you got to the end of it. A milling machine is really what you need to, to get the job done. Also, in days gone by when people did everything on their Myford, they were also prepared to do a lot more hand work than the average person is today. Uh, hand filing, sawing at the bench was quite commonplace and people did great work uh, in that method. But I think today I would say uh, a lathe and a milling machine is the minimum requirements. It doesn't have to be a posh lathe or milling machine. Again, Richard Gibb and I mentioned he bought one of the early Taiwanese milling machines when they came out, the type with the round column, three pulleys on top, a uh, rack and pinion for the head raise and fall. Um, and that's the uh, machine he's built some quite enormous locomotives on, locomotives probably this big. So it doesn't have to be, uh, you don't need a bridge port, you don't need a big lathe, but a lathe and a milling machine is probably the, uh, the go-to strategy. Also, even if you're not planning on building the boiler, you probably do require some brazing equipment because a lot of the assemblies on this thing assume you can braze them together. Um, a little bit on money. Um, the speed I'm building this at and the nature of my build in that I've not used many castings, I've done it all from bar stock, has meant that this has not really been an expensive build. Um, I mean the most expensive thing so far was the blocks of steel for these um, cylinder blocks and you know we're talking you know tens of pounds not hundreds not thousands I think probably for an overall locomotive if you go down the castings route you're talking a few thousand pounds boiler materials could probably be another thousand and if you were to actually buy a finished boiler you could be talking two three more thousand pounds so that's a bit about the project scope um, in terms of actually uh, building the thing you obviously need enough space to have the locomotive i've been to lots of model engineering workshops where so you know in a spare bedroom or some of my early workshops were in my actual bedroom and you do run into a scenario where if you're trying to build something this long plus the tender a meter and a half you need space to build it and you also need to consider about how you're going to handle the finished thing um, not putting age to it but some of my uh, uh, associates who build model en engines by the time they finish it find themselves in a state where they struggle to move it around and I will probably get to that state myself one day but it's worth thinking about how are you going to move this thing around have you got a car suitable to push it in if not are you going to move it around in a trailer where are you going to store it in the workshop how are you going to get it from the workshop into your car if all those things sound like a struggle you may want to pick a engine suitably sized so that you can handle it. This one will be a two-man lift by the time it's finished, um, so either a two-man lift or some uh, mechanical assistance will be required to move this thing around. I've called the next topic project choices, and what I'm saying here is, OK, I'm going to build a locomotive, now which one am I going to pick? And to start this little topic, I'll explain what I've got here. This is a B1 Springbok. Now, a B1 Springbok was a full-size passenger hauling locomotive from, I think, about 1940. And in 1955, a man called Martin Evans scaled it down to this 5-inch gauge. 5-inch gauge being the distance between the wheels. Now, 5-inch gauge works out at roughly 12 times smaller than the original. And it's a full scale down. So, some people think, you know, when you scale it down, you lose a lot. Pretty much all the bits are there. 
and uh, it's going to work just like the full size one did. One interesting point with scaling down is that although you can scale dimensions down with no problem, um, some aspects of physics don't scale down particularly well. For instance, how things run through the fire tubes, how the coal burns, not everything scales down, but by and large it is a replica of the original. Um, now, it's uh, about 40 inches long, a metre, it has a tender that goes out of the back, it has a parallel boiler, coal fired, and it's a good all-rounder, good at hauling passengers on a model track, a nice looking locomotive, and although um, piston valves and sort of fairly involved, as locomotives go, it's in some ways quite simple. So that's this one. Now, I don't want to go and tell you what locomotive you should build. But I'll give you a few examples. If you want a sort of medium sized 5 inch gauge all rounder that can do passenger hauling, isn't too difficult to build and meets a lot of the beginner's criteria, then go and have a look at Simplex and Sweet Pea. Those are two popular beginner's locomotives and uh, either of those will do you well on the track. Um, if you want something a bit smaller, either to suit your machinery or your ability to move it around or just because you want to keep it somewhere that's uh, you know in the house perhaps and you want to put it on a shelf then you could look at a locomotive called Titch that's uh, probably a very small example and also Rob Roy so there's four locomotives you can go and look at they're all good beginners locomotives they cover a range of sizes range of uh, visual appearances so there's a few to go and look at um, have I got anything else to say on this matter my last topic here is on resources and information. By the time you get to building a locomotive, you find that you're constantly needing bits of information to help you make decisions on where the bolts need to go or this or that. And to those of you in professional engineering, it comes as a bit of a surprise to have a set of drawings that don't have all the information on them to make the full thing. Um, and unfortunately, that is very often the case in model engineering drawings. These ones from 1955, they document each piece fairly well, but when you come to build it as an assembly, there's lots of other things to think about. And this was what I was talking about earlier with the locomotive building skill set. You almost need to be looking at the drawings and know how it all fits together to decide exactly how you're going to proceed. Not all the dimensions are there. You have to decide things for yourself as you go along. And having not built one before, that's been one of the challenges for me. And the only way I've overcome that is through the use of various resources. First and foremost, a very kind man by the name of Kieran Sparks uh, put this together for me when I first set out. And um, here, by the way, is a visual of the finished spring box that I'm building. Um, now, what you can see here is a great big pack of laminated sheets. And what he did for me was he took a full series out of the Model Engineer magazine where Martin Evans himself had documented, you know, the full build and written little descriptions on everything, uh, you know, as he went along, giving you examples of where he'd had his ideas from, examples of other locomotives. And for those of you who saw the cylinder blocks, this little uh, thing may be familiar. I've shown this, that's a cylinder block assembly. Um, that is a page out of this model engineer series. So thank you, Kieran, for that. That's been uh, invaluable. Uh, now the documents get you going, but I have relied very heavily on being able to ask individuals questions over the course of this build so far. That is when bits haven't come out quite as expected, or when the drawings don't add up. You really need people who you can ask and say, how does this bit go together? You don't have to, of course, but I think it saves a lot of heartache if you can find someone to help. Now, if you're a club person, you may want to try a model engineering club. There are some definitely some experts around in those. You can try the internet. Hopefully what I'm doing on YouTube adds to the pot and you can of course you know try and find people to email and if you're really stuck you can ask me and I might be able to put you in touch with someone who can help. So those are the things and what I also want to mention here is that um, something like a Springbok, a Simplex, a Rob Roy, a Sweet Pea, a Titch, plenty of them have been built and the errors in the drawings are well documented. Something like this was drawn by hand in 1955 after one person's head and what you often find is that there will be a few errors. 
not many, but enough to cause you some problems. And if those errors aren't documented somewhere, you build the whole thing thinking you're doing fine, you come to put it together and there are problems. So it's well worth building a locomotive that is well documented. Now Simplex and Sweet Pea, I believe, both have had books written about them, a little bit similar to that article I've shown you. So if you can find a book on a locomotive you're going to build, that's going to hopefully give you some uh, um, comfort in uh, knowing that someone else has already built it and they've documented the errors. Speaking about errors and um, heartache, I will mention that you may want to steer clear of a couple of common choices for the beginner which are picking up a half-finished locomotive or building a locomotive from a kit of parts. Both of those can be done um, but I know lots of people who have attempted them and it's been that difficult they've just stopped. Uh, when you get a half-finished locomotive, of which there are plenty, and you take it in, into your own workshop and start trying to finish it, you quickly find things that are not matching the drawings, and by the time you've unpicked it, the phrase that is commonly used is, you might as well have done it from scratch. So, just a word of warning on those. So that's about all I have to say on the topic, but in conclusion I'll say this. Think about what it was you saw in a locomotive that made you want to build it. Was it the running of it? Was it the having something of a small scale matching a full-size one? Was it the mechanical engineering? And one thing you could do to try and crystallise this is to visit a model engineering club where you can see them in action and watch the whole process. Someone getting it out of the car, running it, blowing it down, putting it back in the car. See if that's something you're actually interested in. Also, consider your workshop, consider the size of the equipment and find a locomotive that matches that. It's going to be quite tedious if the locomotive you're trying to build doesn't match the size of your machinery. But also, I mentioned pick something that you like, but one of the important things to think about here is pick something that not only you like as a finished thing, but pick something that you're going to like the journey of building. So, as I said, I mean, we're talking years, it's got to be something you like, both the finished thing and the journey. Okay, you're welcome to continue this discussion in the comments. I'm sure I've left a few things out. But that's pretty much what I wanted to say today. Hopefully that's given you a few ideas of things to go and think about and help you make your own decisions on whether or not to build a locomotive. Well, that's it from me. There's just a few things to get you going and give you an idea of what to think about if you decide to tackle a locomotive. Now, to finish, I'll say this. If you've got a reasonable amount of free time, access to some reasonable machinery and the interest, there's a high chance that if you start your locomotive this week, you'll finish yours before I finish mine. And on that note, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you found this interesting and see you on the next video.